Welcome back. This is Dr. Heather Yost, and this is another episode of the Take Your Life Back Summit, your roadmap out of chronic pain, fatigue, and autoimmune disorders. And I'm so excited to announce our special guest today. It's Dr. Tom O'Brien. And Dr. O'Brien believes in making a difference in the world, one healthy human being at a time. As an internationally recognized and sought after speaker and workshop leader, Dr. O'Brien specializes in the complications of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and autoimmune diseases as they occur outside and inside of the intestines. He is the founder of the doctor.com. He's also an author of The Autoimmune Fix, which I have read and have right here personally and loved. He also has a new film series called Betrayal that we hopefully will talk about a little bit more today for our listeners. So um, thank you for being here. I really feel like uh, it's an honor and a blessing to have you on the summit. Oh, thank you. It's really a pleasure. Uh, you are talking to the people who need to hear this more than anyone else. The people who have tried so many different things to get well, and they just can't get that la over that last hurdle, or maybe the fourth from the last hurdle, you know, whatever right. it is for them, but right. they're just stuck. So it's really a pleasure to be talking to you. Well, thank you for saying that. What really sparked me in starting this summit was just an opportunity for hope for our listeners. Oh, so I wonder, before we start though, I, you are so passionate about what you do and you're doing so much good for this world. Can you tell me what your story is? How did you get here? Why are you doing what you're doing and why are you so passionate? Why am I so passionate? I guess um, the best reason would be uh, when my son was 17, thinking about colleges, he was a junior in high school, and I said to him one day, Jason, I don't care if you go to college. I really don't care. And he looked at me like this. And I love it when I can catch my son's brain because I can't do it very often. I really can't. You know, he's Mensa. He's really, really smart. And that kid's been working me since he was three months old. He knows exactly what to do to calm me down and have me toe the line to do whatever he wants. You know? so when I can catch his brain, that's, that's nice. And I said, Jason, if you look at a brick wall, and when you look at that brick wall, you say, wow, how did they do that? That's really cool. With the, look how they, wow, I wonder how they did that. And you start dreaming about brick walls. I mean, you really do. You go find the best brick wall maker there is to work for. If you have to work for free, you work for them. I'll finance you for a year or two. I'm going to finance school. I'll finance you. Or if you want to be a rock and roll star, I mean, really, man, it's in your blood. You got to do rock and roll. Really? You go do rock and roll. But if you don't have something that grabs you by the, by the cojones and just won't let go, you go to school because that's where you get more exposures than anywhere else. And my prayer is you find something that just grabs you, that you just have to do it. You got to do it in life. And as long as you don't hurt people, it doesn't matter what it is. You will make a huge difference in the world and you'll be a happy man a satisfied man and live a great life. Whew, I love that you said that. Just You have to do something that you just have to do. You just have to do. Yeah, you'll make a huge difference, you said. So that's true. right. That's right. And so that's why I do what I do is because I realized at some point working with patients one-on-one -on -one was great, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And yet um, I found myself saying some of very similar things the vast majority of people, it's, it's like 85-10-5. 85% of the people, irrespective of what they got, get better if they do this. 85% of the people. 10% stay about the same, 5% get worse. Hmm. So I was saying the same thing to everyone to start off with. And when they just did this introductory approach, 85% of them get better. It doesn't matter if it's rheumatoid or if it's migraines or if it's recurrent miscarriages. It didn't matter uh, if it was chronic pain, if it was psoriasis, uh, vitiligo, the loss of skin. Uh, so people that get white spots on their skin. It doesn't matter. If you, if you do this, if you start here, 85% of them get better and they're on the right track. So when I realized that, I realized that 
the whole world needs to hear this. And if I can help 85% of everyone that hears this, and if I can re relay it in, in a convincing enough way so that people don't sit there like this, but rather they say, hmm, all right, well, that seems safe. All right, I'm going to try that. Okay, okay. And if, if I can reach them successfully and 85% of them get better, then that's what I need to do with my life. And so that's why I do what I do. I mean, I love seeing patients. I love talking one-on-one -on -one with patients. And, uh, uh, but carrying this message out uh, to the world, as you said in your introduction, we just completed betrayal, the autoimmune disease secret they're not telling you. And we reached over half a million people. And uh, uh, I interviewed 85 of the world's leaders. I spent a year traveling the world, interviewing the, 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 the godfathers of immunology, the, the people on the cutting edge of doing the research, teaching the professors in the universities what to teach. So I interviewed those people. And then I interviewed the professors at the universities. And then I interviewed the doctors in practice implementing these principles. And then I interviewed the patients applying these principles who got better. And so you see patients talking about reversing MS, reversing rheumatoid, reversing chronic pain, uh, chronic pain reversing fibromyalgia. And, but you see the researcher talking about it, the, the, the geek stuff, which I try to interpret into everyday language, and then the doctors who are applying those geek principles, and then the patients who went to see those doctors. So that's betrayal, the autoimmune disease secret they're not telling you. And, uh, uh, as I said, we reached over half a million people with that, and I'm so grateful. And so that's why I do what I do, I guess. That's the answer. That's awesome. Well, thank you for doing what you do. Can we dive in a little bit as to, for those, some people are diagnosed with autoimmune disorders, and some people aren't wondering if they have it or what it is. Can we dive into what is autoimmunity? You bet. Uh, because the 85% that if I address this, your question is exactly what we have to address. And so I, I am going to answer your question, but before I do, I'm going to take um, a, a, a basic introductory concept first. Great. So that all of you that are listening to this and watching this, we're all on the same page. So let's assume that you walk into the doctor's office for the first time and he's read your um, case history that all the tests that have been done, all the pharmaceuticals you've tried, all the natural treatments you've tried, all the vitamins you've tried. They've looked at all of that, and these are the symptoms that you present with. And the doctor is going to say, now, Mrs. Patient, we're going to, this, this is a table, you know, have you lay down in a minute on the table. But before we do, we're just standing looking at the table. I'd like you to imagine that you are lying on the table. That's your body with its current symptoms. So that's your body with the current symptoms. Now in a moment, I'm, if it's okay, I'm gonna to touch your arm and ask you to take a step backwards. Is that okay? And you say, well, yeah, okay. Because they have no idea what I'm doing. And I say, okay. So we're looking at your body on the table with the current symptoms you have that you want to get rid of. Okay, are we good there? Yes, we're good. Okay, now can you take a step back? What we have to do is step back and look at your body with its symptoms and not be your body with the symptoms. You have to take a step back to get the big picture. And because I have people actually move their body backwards, take a step backwards, the physical act of movement helps to embrace the concept, the mental concept of take a step back and get a big picture. So it really helps. So that's what I have to ask all of you to do now is just to imagine we're taking a step back from, well, what's that got to do with my migraines? Or what does that have to do with the three miscarriages I've had? You know, so take a step back from that and just listen to the next 10, 15 minutes of this introduction, and then we'll get into specifics. But if you just listen to the introduction, see if it doesn't make sense to you. If it does make sense, I'm gonna try my best not to talk geek. If it does make sense to you, buy my book and then read the book because that's where you get all the detail right. and then you really dial it down. It'll take you a month, two months to read the book. It'll take a while because it's not easy reading. It's not really scientific, but every, every paragraph is like, wow, I never thought of that before. Wow, right. that's really interesting. My daughter 
seems to have. Or, and then the next paragraph is, wow, 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 I didn't never thought of that before. You know, I used to have, and you're just going to be dancing with the concepts. So my goal is to give you the introduction, take a step back, for you to hear this interview and say, wow, that just makes sense. All right, I'm going to spend some time and look into this. So the first concept I have to give you, I'm going to make the assumption that everyone here is in chronic pain. They, they, they have a chronic condition, meaning it's been around for a while. Chronic means it's not going away. Acute means it just happened. You fell down and you broke your leg. That's acute. Chronic means it's been building up and it's there. You tried something, helped a little bit, it came back. You know, but it's there. So the first thing in understanding chronic conditions, to take a step back with a chronic condition is you have to allocate one hour. One hour. Many of the, uh, the lectures I give, I start with a slide that is a picture I took of a marble stand with a glass dome on top of it so you can see through the glass. And it's from the Museum of Science in Florence, Italy. It's Galileo's finger. And Galileo bequeathed, and you go to Amazon and type in Galileo's finger, and you'll see there's two or three books about it. You, you can read the story. But Galileo bequeathed that all of his inventions could be on display for all of humanity, as long as they also displayed his finger. Now, between you and I, it happened to be his middle finger. So, you know, he was giving a message, but one finger, right? One finger. So I, I start with that because the key to success in dealing with the symptoms you're currently having, take a step back and take a look and see you're on the table with those symptoms. The key to success is to allocate one hour a week to learning more about your condition. Because nobody's got time to dive into this all day, every day. Nobody's got time to watch 10 interviews, 15 interviews, 20 interviews, and kind of go through your notes and then apply the principle. Nobody's got the time to do it. So you take one hour a week. One hour a week, you watch one of these interviews from this summit. One hour a week. And you just think about it for a couple of days. Or one hour a week, you read a little bit of my book. And you just think about it for a couple of days. You see if, if, if it relates to you, that's where you pause. Say, well, I need to dive into that more. Mm -hmm. But you give patience. You have patience with yourself and kindness with yourself. So if you have kindness and patience and know that over time, you're going to really get this. Six months from now, You've got this down. And if I were to say to you, Mrs. Patient, it's going to take six months to knock out your symptoms. Would you be willing to entertain this? If I say there's an 85% chance you can knock out your symptoms within six months. If you're willing to entertain this, then keep listening. If you're not willing to entertain that, then turn us off now. Wait, wait for the next interview in the summit and then watch that one and say, uh, I don't need to listen to that guy. Right? But if you're willing to allocate one hour a week, Sunday mornings after church, or Tuesday nights after I feed the kids dinner. Whenever it is that works in your schedule, one hour a week. It's the persistence that will give you success in getting over the hump or the fourth hump, you know, wherever you are in dealing with the chronic condition you've got. So that's the first concept, one hour a week. The second concept, what is autoimmune disease? This is patient. Your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you. There's an army, an air force, a Marines, a Coast Guard, a Navy, IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM. There are many different branches of the immune system. You see, you're, you're a physician and you're smiling because you say, oh, that's really cute. Yeah, it is. It's really cute. And it works. It works. People get that. Our doctors don't get that. I'll show you why in a minute. Our doctors don't get that. But people get that. Every branch of the immune system has different responsibilities to protect you. When your immune system is working really hard to protect you, let's say, let's say there's an invasion. Let's just say there's an invasion and the, the Navy's been called out, the Air Force has been called out, the Army's been called out, 
the Marines are on the coastline, you know, to make sure. Let, let, let's say it was after Pearl Harbor, for example. You know, that's something that most of us can relate to. We've heard stories or seen movies about that. You can be sure that along the coastline of California, that everyone was vigilant on guard, right? That's the Army. That's IgG. So when you're on guard, and if you're actually now fighting a battle, and you're fighting a battle, your immune system is fighting a battle, and I'll get into more detail later on that, but when your immune system is fighting a battle, sometimes they're so overworked when they're fighting so hard, they get a little trigger happy. And when they get a little trigger happy, mistakes happen, right? We, we, we all can understand how soldiers that are on the line are in a foxhole for 36 hours fighting the enemy. They, they haven't slept. They're just fighting for their lives. Lots of adrenaline. They get tired then more fighting and all. They can make a mistake. Well, it turns out your immune system is not making mistakes. But what's happening is it's fighting so hard, there's almost like collateral damage that occurs and your own cells, your own tissue get damaged. When your own tissue gets damaged, antibodies are soldiers that go out to attack things. They attack bad bacteria. You know, you drop an apple on the ground, you pick it up, you wipe it off, you eat it. If there's some bacteria from the dirt, you wipe the dirt off, but not quite completely, so there's a little bacteria in there and you eat the apple, the bacteria is now in your stomach and your intestines, your body's got to make antibodies to fight this stuff. Or you, um, you know, you, it's late at night, you go out to get a snack from the refrigerator, you, you, you don't want to open, turn the light on in the kitchen because you're half asleep, you know, and so you open the refrigerator, the light's in the back and everything's in the front kind of dimming the light, so you just grab the raspberries and you eat some of the raspberries and you say, well, what's that fuzz? And you turn there's white fuzz on the raspberries and you've eaten a bunch of raspberries with a lot of mold on them. Your immune system has to make the antibodies to fight the mold. And we do that all day, every day, all day, every day. But what happens when your immune system is working so hard and so vigilant, there's sometimes collateral damage. Now, we, Mrs. Patient, you have a whole new body every seven years, an entire new body. Some cells reproduce really quick, like the inside lining of your gut every three to five days, about that one study said seven days. You have a whole new lining to your gut. It's like the skin of a snake, you just kind of shed it and make new cells, new cells, new cells. Other cells are really slow, like your bone cells are really slow. But every seven years, you have a whole new body. So when cells get old, let's say a thyroid cell, when it gets old or it's gotten damaged, some toxic stuff or something, your body has to make antibodies to get rid of the old damaged cells. That's normal. Or here's a better example. When you exercise and you're pumping iron, you know, to build up your bicep muscle, and you know the next day where your arms are really sore because you worked out pretty hard, that's because there's inflammation in there and you've torn some of the muscle fibers. That's what exercise is, micro trauma to the muscle fibers. And then you get rid of those damaged muscle cells. Antibodies are made to get rid of those damaged muscle cells and you make new muscle cells. You have to make room for the new cells. You get rid of the old cells. So your immune system makes antibodies to get rid of old thyroid cells, old muscle cells, old brain cells, old heart cells. There's a normal reference range. So if you get a blood test to look at antibodies to your thyroid, there's a normal range. Why would we ever have antibodies to our own tissue? Because you got to get rid of the old damaged cells to make room for new cells. That's normal. But when you have elevated levels of antibodies, when you're outside the normal range, now you're killing off more cells than you're making. That's autoimmunity. When you're killing off more cells than you're making, now you're killing off more thyroid cells or you're killing off more brain cells. And you know, okay, you don't feel that when that's happening, but if you've got elevated antibodies to something called myelin basic protein, which is the saran wrap around the nerves, and you have elevated levels of antibodies to myelin basic protein, you're killing off the myelin. You're not making as much as you're destroying, right? So what's myelin? Mrs. Patient, if you take the wire from the battery of a car that goes to the headlight of the car, and in the middle of that wire, if you could take off the insulation so the wire's exposed, 
Now touch that exposed wire to the frame of the car. The headlights flicker on and off. And you say, what's wrong with the headlights? There's nothing wrong with the headlights. It's the wire, right? That's MS. That's exactly what MS is. When you've had elevated antibodies to myelin basic protein or one of the other proteins, there's three proteins, when you have elevated antibodies to those proteins, you take off the insulation on the nerve, it exposes the nerve, then the brain can't send the message to your legs or your arms or wherever it's supposed to go, and then your leg or your arm or wherever that nerve's supposed to go doesn't work very good. That's MS. So that's autoimmunity. Autoimmunity is when you have elevated levels of antibodies. The antibodies are not a problem. It's the elevated level of antibodies that's a problem, okay? Now, next concept. I'm a geek. I just read the research all the time. I love reading the research. I go, oh, look at that. Sometimes I tape the research papers on the ceiling of my bedroom. And I go, <laughs> I go to sleep, you know, and I look at it and say, wow. And I wake up in the middle of the night and sometimes I just write stuff down. Because I, I used to think I'd remember. I don't remember. I don't I get up in the morning. What was that? I forgot, whatever it was. So I write it down, right? So I read the research. So what I'm about to tell you is just all research. And in my lectures to doctors, I show them study after study after study after study. So we think that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in this country and cancer is number two. Well, two points to that. First, um, the National Institute of Health tells us that 22 million people a year get cardiovascular disease, diagnosed with cardiovascular disease. Nine million people a year are diagnosed with cancer. 24 million people a year are diagnosed with autoimmune diseases. That's the first point. Second point, we know that only one out of th three people with a diagnosed or with an autoimmune disease is diagnosed. They're not diagnosed. That means there's 72 million people out there, three times 24. Third point, cardiovascular disease that we think is the number one cause of getting sick and dying in the world is autoimmune in its initiating phases. It begins as an autoimmune mechanism. So what becomes a primary cause of getting sick and dying in the world? It's your immune system attacking your own tissue, which from what I told you a minute ago is collateral damage. That's what the new science is telling us. It's all comes from, I shouldn't say all, I'm sorry. That's an exaggeration. Most of it, comes from collateral damage of your immune system trying to protect you. So that's really important to understand. And once again, that's outlined in my book and big This is where 85% of the people that get this stuff, if you take the time one hour a week to get this, you now will know what to do to address your complaints lying on the table, whatever those complaints are. Recurrent miscarriages, sure. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, sure. Uh, severe depression, sure. Bipolar disorder, sure. Schizophrenia, sure. Most of the time, you're going to get better if you think from this concept. So the question is, why is my immune system working so hard? That's the question. Why is it working so hard that there's so much collateral damage? Now, let me take it to the next point. It was about four months ago, maybe a little more than that, that the World Wildlife Fund published a paper with two major universities to say, on average, there has been a 57% loss of all wildlife on the planet since 1970, 57%. Now I read that article in a newspaper when I was flying home uh, from Austin, Texas, back to San Diego, and I said, oh, that's too bad. And I turned the page, read the next article got home or got to the airport, walked out to the parking lot, got in my car, driving home on the highway. I almost hit the brakes. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. 57% of everything has been killed off on average in 46 years? 57% of the woodpeckers? Yes. The red robins? Yes. The rainbow trout? Yes. The polar bears? Yes. And those percentages are higher around around fresh water. Why? Because they're drinking the water. 
If you would drink the water coming out of the stream that's by your house or the river that's a mile away, you'd get cancer quicker, quicker. You'd be unable to reproduce just like they are, and you'd be dying off quicker too. We just filter the water. So we're getting minor traces of all those toxic chemicals that are now accumulating in our bodies. And that's what your immune system is trying to protect you from. Listen to this point. Every child checked today at birth, every child that's checked in the U.S. has on average 186 toxic chemicals in the placental blood at birth that aren't supposed to be there. 186. Many of these chemicals bind onto the brain. They impact on the development of the brain so that the brain doesn't develop properly. That's a major, major contributor to the epidemic we have of autism in our country. We have over a million kids a year now diagnosed with autism. When I came out in practice in 1980, it was one child in every 4,856, I think it was. Now, it's two years ago, it was one child, wait a minute, my wife's sitting right over there, one child in two years ago. 63, according to uh, the Center for Disease Control, and by the year, what year? 2000, no, it was, yeah, in 2016, but by the year 2030, 2032, it's one child in two. They're, they're, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, says by 2032, one child in two will be diagnosed with autism, be on the autism spectrum in this country. We have to wake up. We're polluting the planet to the point to where we're killing off the wildlife. Over half of everything is gone in 46 years. And we're affecting the brain development of our kids. And we are getting sicker. And your immune system is trying to protect you because you're exposed to this stuff every day. Look, I got a bottle of water here to keep me hydrated while I'm talking to you. It's in plastic. The chemicals in this plastic get in the water. Well, what am I gonna do? Well, I'm in Mexico right now, so I don't have glass bottles here to get a bottled water. So this is better than drinking out of the tap. So I think, anyway, I'm hoping it is. So, you know, <laughs> you know it's like a teeter-totter. So you do the less of the evils trying to figure out what to do, right? So that is the big picture. Take a step back. If 85% of the people will listen to this and spend one hour a week and you get it, you stop using saran wrap and you stop using Tupperware and you stop going to the coffee shop and ordering your coffee or your tea with the plastic lid on it. And rather you take a stainless steel container in and say, fill it up. And you take your shoes off at the door because you're walking around out there and your neighbor sprayed the sidewalk with Roundup to kill the dandelions three days ago and you walk on the sidewalk, so you now have Roundup on your shoes and you walk in the house on the carpet, Roundup's now on the carpet, your kids, are, your infants are crawling around on the carpet or your teenage kids are on the floor on the carpet in the living room doing their homework while watching TV. And they, they get Roundup on themselves. So you leave your shoes at the door. There are all of these things you have to think differently. You can't live the way that we've been living and think that your children, your grandchildren, yourself, that your immune system is just going to protect you. It's going to do everything it can to protect you. And it's the collateral damage that you're getting that's causing this dramatic increase in all of the diseases, the autoimmune diseases, uh, autism, uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. We're all going like this. And there's now, there's, I just came out of a weekend workshop with Dr. Dale Bredesen from UCLA. He runs the Buck Institute. That's the Alzheimer's Research Center. He's the guy that published on reversing Alzheimer's in nine out of 10 people in five years, completely reversing it. Now he has over 100. That paper came out two and a half years ago. Now he has over 100. But it takes five years because you got to go down the checklist. There are 37 points on the checklist. Do they have food sensitivities? Do they get enough sleep? Do they walk a little bit every day? Do, um, is the air clean where they live? There's 37 points. There are five different types of Alzheimer's now that have been identified. One of them is called inhalation Alzheimer's. You can't live in a moldy house. You can't walk into a house and say, oh, that's the smell of my house. No, that's mold. 
and you can't live in that because you breathe it. You think you're, you're fine when you're there, but you're, you, you can't because it gets, you breathe it in, it goes through the lungs, very permeable, into the bloodstream, right up to the brain, and that causes inflammation in the brain. The inflammation of the soldier is trying to protect you, and then the collateral damage comes, and over time, you get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. It's called inhalation Alzheimer's. They published a study, Dr. Louise Calderon, the University of Montana, she published a study a few years ago. Every child they check now, every single child in Mexico City has evidence of early Alzheimer's. Children. Children, every child. First, they did it on dogs in the 90s. Every dog had evidence of Alzheimer's. That's called beta amyloid plaque. Every one, every dog. So then they got the blood of children and they found the same evidence in the kids. Every child. Now that's Mexico City, but how clean is your air? You wanna know how clean your air is? Go to the car wash. Go to an expensive car wash, you know, the really nice ones where the guys are there and they wipe it down afterwards. They've got the little water bottles on their hips. You know, they spray the windows and, you know, they wipe it all down and all that, right? Right? Then park, park your car outside for six hours. Run your hand across the windshield. Say, what's that? That's what you're breathing. You just can't see it, but that's what you're breathing. Inhalation Alzheimer's. It's just the straw that breaks the camel's back. Remember I said there's a balance and you want more of the anti-inflammatory and less of the inflammatory. Unfortunately, in the world we live in now, it's like this. Right. The inflammatory, the stuff that causes your immune system to try and protect you is so active and overactive, we're getting the collateral damage of autoimmune disease. So I'm going to take a break now because that's the big picture. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you. That brought so much clarity to, I think, the whole picture for so many people. With autoimmunity, if we're all exposed to so many things that cause inflammation in the body and ultimately cause overproduction of these antibodies, is there any point in testing? Yes. Yes. You have to have biomarkers of where you currently are. So as you apply principles six months or a year from now, you feel a little better, but you have to make sure that you've stopped the inflammatory cascade because you can feel better and still have elevated myelin antibodies killing off your brain because you don't feel that until you're so far advanced that um, it's too late. So absolutely, you have to check where are you now so that that's your baseline. Well, Mrs. Pa <laughs> Patients, uh, you know, they come to me, they, they used to come to me and they heard I was kind of a nutcase, you know, that I was out there a bit which is fine and it does. so in the first visit you know we do our tests and we give them some recommendations on ways to eat and things all right come back in a couple of weeks the tests will be back and when they come back you know like everyone patients go see a doctor and they're getting test results they're all nervous you know and they sit down and they're really nice and polite and quiet but you can see the anxiety in their eyes you know they, and so what I always say is Mrs. Patient good news you're a mess <laughs> And they look at me and I say, this is great. These are all functional tests. We can fix this. If, if my tests come back and there's nothing wrong, you really got a problem, right? Right. I mean, I love the people that have been to Mayo. I've been to Mayo Clinic twice. I say, that's great. And they look at me. They don't know what's wrong. I said, that's great. And they look at me and say, if you had a disease, Mayo Clinic would find it. You've got dysfunction. Let's see what's not functioning right. And they go, oh. Oh, well, that makes sense. So when we do our tests, they're probably going to come back and let's hope they show some problems. But then when they come back in two weeks, they forget I said that and they're nervous. And I say, good news, you're a mess. And they go, what? You got lots of problems. Look, look at all these problems. This is great. We can fix all this. Right? And so, and then they laugh and they smile and then they understand, you know, you got to take a step back. And obviously there's got to be a lot of stuff wrong because you're suffering. Something's right. got to be wrong. The tests come back negative, wrong tests. Right. I love that you said that. Tests come back negative, wrong tests. You've mentioned before that um, you can actually predict autoimmune diseases sometimes up to 30 years. How do you do that? Right, it's called predictive autoimmunity. The godfather of that, who I interviewed three times in betrayal, uh, he was so kind with his time. His name is Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld. And this guy, holy cow. This guy, I think the best thing to his name is now 28, as far as I know, it's 28. 
28 of the doctors who got their PhD studying under him, 28 of them now chair departments of immunology in medical schools and hospitals around the world. They run the departments and they're all his students. Mm -hmm. This is the godfather. And he's the godfather of predictive autoimmunity. Now what's predictive autoimmunity? You do a blood test and you look for the standard antibodies that you often find elevated for people. And they, uh, so there's a panel that we put together. There's six for the brain, three for the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, the gut, four for the gut, your bones, your reproductive system. So it's 24 different antibodies that we're looking for. And you're looking to see, do they come back elevated? When I did this test, I was 44. When I did this test, I was doing triathlons quite regularly. And I was scoring in the top 10% of the men between 30 and 35. And I was 44. So I was walking, hey, I'm a stud. I'm, yeah, you know, I'm not aging, right? You know, that, that silly stuff, right? But I did that test at 44, and I was fine. I was quite healthy. I had three antibodies to my, my brain elevated. Three. Myelin basic protein, that's what causes MS. Cerebellum peptides, that's the area of the brain that when it shrinks, this is why old people can't run up and down stairs gracefully. They don't have the balance, they gotta hold the railing. It's your cerebellum that's been shrinking for years. And gangliosides, that's what causes the whole brain to shrink and causes non-Alzheimer's dementia. I had all three of these elevated. I called the lab and I said, what is this? This is a mistake. They said, no, it's not. I said, do it again. They said, we did. We know it's you. We did it again. It's accurate. Sorry. And I said, whoa, whoa. That's what woke me up. You don't feel when you've got elevated antibodies to your cerebellum. Right. You don't feel when you have elevated antibodies to your heart, killing off your heart. I'll give you an example. Patient comes in at 44 years old. His father father died at 44 of a massive coronary. His two older brothers died in their early 40s of massive coronaries. When his last brother, he was the last male in the family. Mm -hmm. When the last brother died, he was 28. He went to a cardiologist that put him on a statin. That's the chemicals to reduce cholesterol. He didn't have high cholesterol, but they did it preventively. So he'd been on a statin now for 16 years. He was the picture of health. His body fat was 16%. He was exercising regularly, took a bunch of vitamins, never ate junk food ever, looked really healthy. All of his blood tests were healthy when he sees his doctors. Happy man, successful in his work, lovely family, the picture of a successful life. He said, but I, wanted, I, I heard about your tests. I want to do your tests. Hmm. Smart man. And because his three older uh, males had died in their early 40s. His test came back sky high antibodies to all three heart antibodies that we test. Sky high. He said, Why is this? I said, I don't know. Let's find out. Let's figure it out. And he had elevated antibodies to wheat and to dairy. We took wheat and dairy out of his life completely. Don't cheat. Out of his life completely. And I didn't have to give him any vitamins. He was taking a ton of vitamins. That's all we did. Six months later, we did the test again. Heart antibodies down to normal. No longer was his immune system killing off his heart. He didn't feel anything because he was exercising, eating well, happy man. So he thought his life was good. But his immune system, because of his genetics, were going after his heart. That was the weak link in his chain. Mrs. Patient. You pull at a chain, it breaks at the weakest link. It's at one end, the middle, the other end. It's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys. Wherever your genetic weak link is, that's where the chain's going to break. So obviously what we have to do is stop pulling on the chain, right? And so that's why he said, why is that? And I said, I don't know. It turned out for him, every time he ate wheat or he ate dairy, he was pulling on his chain. And the weak link was his heart. That's where the antibodies were being made. It's called cross-reactivity. And uh, there are many, many papers on this in the literature now. So predictive autoimmunity is looking for these antibodies that are elevated. There's a normal reference range for all of them. It's fine. You, you know, it's normal to have some. 
But when you have elevated antibodies, once again, you're killing off more cells than you're making. That makes so much sense. I think that really brings it into perspective for the listeners to, to understand how this can happen and what that means for you and why it's so important to think ahead, so to speak. Are there any physical signs or symptoms that um, you mentioned, like you don't feel the antibodies being elevated, but are there any early predictor signs of autoimmunity? Oh, sure, sure. And uh, the predictive signs of autoimmunity is you don't feel well. You just don't feel well. What does that mean? And you have no explanation. Yeah. Well, you've been to the doctors and they say you're healthy or they've given you something to take care of your complaint. You still have a complaint. Well, that may mean I'm, I'm just going to make up a number. Let's say you've got um, 35 million cells that make up your liver. Well, maybe you've only got 28 million cells left because you've been killing off liver cells for the last eight years or 10 years. Maybe that's it. Or maybe it's your thyroid and you get cold hands and feet and you wear socks to bed and you can't wake up in the morning. You wish you had 20 more minutes in bed and you can't lose those extra five pounds even if you don't eat for two days. You know, all signs of thyroid, but you do a blood test and your thyroid hormone levels are normal. Well, yeah, you've got normal hormone levels, but you got elevated antibodies that are killing off your thyroid. That may be the mechanism for you if that's the weak link in your chain. Boy, very good. I like the analogy of the weak link in your chain. Um, if you couldn't test, for those people that um, maybe can't test or don't know how or where would they start, if you could give these people with pain or autoimmune disease um, three main points or three big points, what would that be? Read my book, read my book, read my book. Very good. And just as a reminder, they can find that on Amazon.com. Yes, yes. Uh, I'd suggest that you go to my website to get the book, thedr.com. Don't spell the word doctor out, just thedr.com. Yep. And it just gives you the link to Amazon. But when you go through the website, there's some downloads that you get for free so that you can, there's some more information that we're giving you that uh, since I wrote the book, there's some new things that have come out. Uh, awesome. So if you go to thedoctor.com, you'll see the book on the front page. Just click on it. It's supposed to work that way. I say, I've never clicked on it. It's supposed to work. I hope it does. I'll test it for you <laughs> before this launches. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, but, uh, and then there's some free downloads for you there also. I understand that you're gifting um, our audience a special gift as well. Can you explain that? Um, I'd love to, but you have to tell me what it is. You are giving away the gluten fact pack. Oh, yes. Good. Thanks. Yep. Um, um, I did this thing three years ago where I traveled the world and I interviewed 29 of the world leaders about wheat sensitivity with or without celiac disease. I interviewed Professor Schoenfeld. That's where I met him first time was for the gluten summit. Uh, uh, I interviewed Professor Michael Marsh that if your doctor thinks you've got celiac disease, the test you do is called an endoscopy. They put a tube down, and they look at your intestines, and they snip a little piece, and look at it under a microscope. And the classification is Marsh 1, Marsh 2, Marsh 3. This is Marsh. This is the godfather of it all. Really wonderful man. Wonderful, like a Kris Kringle kind of guy. <laughs> an elder. And uh, uh, Dr. Lauren Cordain, the founder of the whole paleo movement 30 years ago, the one who first started talking about eat more the way our ancestors ate. Uh, Dr. Mark Houston, the world famous vascular biologist, that means the health of your blood vessels from Vanderbilt University, all these experts I interviewed and um, like this summit, that kind of thing. And um, uh, we aired it um, three years ago, uh, oh, close, yeah, three and a half years ago. And this is the best of the gluten summit. There's little pearls we've taken from all of those interviews for you. So you can say, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Wow. And uh, all of these pieces of information that help put it together for you. There's that. And there's a handout in there called the conundrum of gluten sensitivity, why the tests are often wrong. And when you read that handout, you'll understand that the tests your doctors want to do are almost all the time not the right tests. They're the tests of 10 years ago or 15 years ago. They're good tests, but they're not complete. And they've got a lot of missing links. 
And so you miss a lot if that's the only test you do. So that handout, I wrote that handout and I put the research articles in there so you read it, it makes sense to you. Um, if you follow my thinking here on this interview, that's the way the handout is, I wrote it that way. And, um, but then when you give it to your doctors, I also put the studies in there that they can read. They say, oh, I didn't know that, wow. I didn't know that. Well, this sounds like a good test. Let's try it. So that's called the conundrum of gluten sensitivity. So um, that's another gift for you guys here today. Thank you so much. So I just want to say to everybody that's listening, folks, you must take advantage of this and go to that website and get that free information from him. As we're winding down today, I want to ask you a couple fun questions. I know that you're in Mexico right now, so I'm curious. I've been asking every speaker if there's two things if we open up your fridge, is, are there two things that we would always find? And I guess, do those two things transfer to Mexico with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, they've, they've not transferred to Mexico because uh, we just <laughs> arrived here. Um, and I don't know that we'll find a store here to buy these things. And I didn't want to bring them in the suitcases. Uh, um, but yeah, one of the things you do for your health is that um, uh, when you go wheat free, uh, uh, which people feel much better when they do. Yeah. Um, you, you have to replace, there's a category of foods called prebiotics. Prebiotics are the foods that feed the good guys in your gut, the good bacteria in your gut. Right. And for 78% of North Americans, the prebiotic that they eat is wheat. So when you stop eating wheat, which is a good thing to do, you have to replace the prebiotics. If you don't do that, you get sick in two or three months. You feel lousy, and the gluten-free diet doesn't really help you. There are some other problems developed because the good guys in your gut aren't getting fed, and now the bad guys in your gut take over. So you, you have to replace the good guys. I'm, I'm sorry, you have to replace the food for the good guys when you get wheat out of there. So how do you do that? Go to Whole Foods or go to a natural market in your town and get five different types of fermented vegetables. As long as they're not pasteurized, five different types. There's sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, curry flavored, uh, fermented beets, uh, Italian flavored. Just get five different types and just put them in the refrigerator. Every day you walk by the refrigerator and you take a forkful of one of them. Just a forkful. Because the um, two forkfuls is better, but I'll be happy with one. You know, because some doctors say, well, that's not enough. They should take more than a forkful. Well, I agree, but I'm going to be really happy if they get at least one in, right? Later, you can tell them to take two. But let's let them get one first, right? Well, I don't eat sauerkraut. I don't like sauerkraut. That's fine. Just take the juice of, or I get sick if I eat fermented vegetables. Just take the juice of the sauerkraut, put it in your salad dressing. Mix it with the salad dressing. You're still going to get some of the benefits of it because... The fermenting of the vegetables is good bacteria that's developing. That's what fermentation means. Beer is fermented, you know, and there's bacteria in beer. So can we have uh, beer instead? Well, uh, <laughs> gluten-free beer. I don't know if a gluten-free beer is a prebiotic. My uh, <laughs> wife is over there laughing. She's just, <laughs> some guys would love to hear that. I don't. I don't know if it is or not. <laughs> Let's stick to the real fermented food. I just couldn't help but ask. That's a, <laughs> that's that's a valid question. Thinking. <laughs> I set myself up for that one. Uh, but you, know, you, but you, you have a fork full every day of fermented vegetables. And then you, you go to Google and you type in list of prebiotic foods. Whew, comes the list. You say, oh, bananas, that's a prebiotic? Yeah. Oh, artichokes, that's a prebiotic? Yeah. They say, oh, apples, that's a prebiotic? Yeah. And so you see all these different foods and just make sure to eat two prebiotic foods from the list and have fermented vegetables every day. Just a little bit of fermented vegetables every day without exception. So that would normally be in my refrigerator is the fermented vegetables. There's probably nine or 10 different kinds at home right now, something like that. Awesome, what would be the second thing that people always see in your fridge? What's the second thing that people would see in my refrigerator? Uh, um, organic eggs, uh, uh, let's see, what else is in there? Um, the vegetables, there's a uh, co-op in the area. You know, you, you pay a certain amount to a farm and um, then whatever they harvest, that's what you get, right? right? So we, we get a box of vegetables every week and say, what is this? 
and uh, they have to look on the list. Oh, this is a uh, rudimumba. So, oh, I've never eaten a rudimumba baba before. I, I wonder what you do with that. Then, then you go to Google and you type in rudimumba baba, and then you yeah. say, oh, well, uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to dice it up. And I'm going to saute it with some other vegetables, and we'll try it like that. And I do that a lot. Um, the other thing that you'll always find in my refrigerator um, are root vegetables. Right. Root vegetables are the very best food for the good bacteria in your gut. So the fermented vegetables help to inoculate, give you more good bacteria, and the vegetables that you're eating are food for the good bacteria in your gut. But root vegetables are like big uh, grand course meals for the good bacteria in your gut. There's a really great article that everyone might want to read. If you go to scientificamerican.com, it's called My Microbiome and Me. My Microbiome and Me. And especially women who read this article, you're going to start wanting to eat Chinese yams and bitter melon every day because you see the picture of this roly-poly PhD um, Chinese um, uh, researcher working here in the United States and, you know, packed on another 50, 80 pounds, something like that over the years because he's working so hard. Then he remembered his grandmother telling him the story about bitter melon and Chinese yams and just eats them every once in a while, keeps your weight where it should be. Remember that as a kid, his grandmother told him that. So he started doing it. And then you see a picture of him two years later, just standing up against the wall. He's buff. He's buff. And he didn't do anything else. But when you use the root vegetables, you feed the bacteria in your gut that keep you lean. When you don't have the right food for the bacteria in your gut, you feed the bacteria in your gut that keep you hoarding calories, like you're starving, and you gain weight. Um, that's the Pima Indians. The Pima Indians in the four corners of the Southwest have been there for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. How do they live there? You can't grow anything there. It's desert. How do they survive and thrive and reproduce in the desert? Well, only the strong ones survive. The weaker ones die off and don't reproduce. So the stronger ones survive and they thrive. How do they do that? They developed a, a large concentration of the bacteria in their gut that hoard calories. So they're very efficient at whatever they can find to eat. They get every calorie out of that, and they store a lot. That's what the bacteria in the gut do for you, is determine how you respond to the food that you eat. It's one of the things they do. So the Pima Indians have a whole lot of the bacteria. It's called Firmicutes. They have a whole lot of this bacteria that stores and hoards, because that's how they survive, right? Now fast forward to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and now these Indians, Pima Indians, are eating the same food everyone else in America is eating, and they're getting fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter, to where now today, by the age of 35, 50% of Pima Indians are morbidly obese and have diabetes. Wow. By the age of 35, 50% of them. They're huge, and why are they huge? It's because of the bacteria in their gut, that's how they survived for hundreds and hundreds of years, but now they're eating pork rinds and you know, like, every, like well, what everybody, deep fried onion rings at A&W and everything else that we eat uh, on occasion, they're eating the same thing, but their bacteria hoard. So if you can't lose weight, if you've been trying and you just can't lose weight, most likely a strong contributing component to that, too much formicides, not enough bacterioides, try bitter melon and Chinese yams. So get the article, Scientific American, my microbiome in me, and you'll go, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And then you're going to go say, now you're going to try and find Chinese yams, and you're going to find, where am I going to find Chinese yams? And no, they don't have it, they don't have it, they don't have it. You have to go to a Chinese store and ask them for Chinese yams, right. and then they'll get them for you, right? Or Chinese bitter melon, and they'll get them for you. And you say, well, this doesn't taste too bad if I make these. And then in six months, you're like, whoa, what happened to you, girl? Right? Because I mean, that's... <laughs> You know, their microbiome, that, that's, a, that's a, people get their PhDs just studying the microbiome. There's so much to learn about this that we didn't know about 15, 20 years ago. Right. 
Well, you have gifted us so many pearls. This has been such an excellent interview. And I just thank you so much for your time. I know you're so busy and obviously on vacation. Um, but thank you for taking the time to do this. It means a lot to me. I know we're, we're reaching out to a lot of people and your message is so powerful. So thank you for being here, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say how we started this. You don't have time to mess around. We're killing off the planet. Yeah. You can't keep your head buried in the sand thinking, well, I'm fine. No, you're not. It's your kids and your grandkids are going to suffer tremendously just because of the level of poisons in the formaldehyde in the kitchen cabinets because right. press board is soaked with formaldehyde in the varnish on the tables, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, dry cleaning chemicals in the clothes, in the uh, fire retardant chemical. How many people you know have survived a fire by wearing fire retardant clothing? Right. Right. And we put our babies in this stuff. You need cotton. Just read my book. You'll see all this. You just don't have time to mess around. Now. I never thought I'd be an alarmist, but I am. I am. Well, it's because you know too much or you know That's just right. enough to be passionate to change the world. Yeah. Maybe yeah. So more people like one that, hour, so. one hour one a hour. week, get one hour a week because and get that book. Thank you yeah, so much I'm because it's next. so overwhelming. I know it's overwhelming. I know this is watch this interview a couple of times. If you can stand looking at me that much, <laughs> you know, please do, you know, but watch a couple of times, get the book, Allocate an hour a week, and in six months, your neighbors will be asking you, what have you been doing? Yeah. You look great. And your kids aren't getting sick when all the other kids in the classroom got sick, right? Because they're stronger. They have stronger microbiomes. They're healthier. Yeah. So one hour a week. One hour. I know you're overwhelmed right now. My apologies for that. I don't know how else to do it. You know, we, we, we've got this one window to get to you with this message. So hopefully, uh, 80, 85, 10, 5. 85% right. of you will look at this a little further. I really yeah. hope so. And go so, to thedr.com, thedr.com for more information. But I think the message truly is do something. Like do something different yeah. than what you've done before so that you can get something different. And again, just like Dr. O'Brien said, listen to the interviews again and again if you need to. We're going to be here tomorrow with additional experts with more awesome information. Before we go, thank you, Dr. Tom. Have a fabulous rest of your time in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you to your wife for sharing you with us here at the Take Your Life Back Summit. This is yeah. Dr. Heather Yost. Take care, be well, and I'll see you tomorrow.